Welcome to MEM 11011. Undertake Manual Handling. Welcome to Pertech Learn and Developments. This lecture is part of the resources made available to you for this unit. Make sure you have a copy of the participants' handbook, as this will be useful in completing the online activities and practical assessments. Participants' handbooks are available for online viewing and for downloading. Most workplace activities involve moving things around and pushing things, loading, unloading. As with any workplace activity, this involves some type of skill and technique. Incorrect handling is one of the major causes of workplace injury and loss of productivity. What will we be learning today? We will be learning about workplace hazards, the type of injuries and the ways to prevent these injuries. The correct lifting technique, using an appropriate mechanical aid can make all the difference. Let's introduce some new terms for today's lecture. Muscular Skeletal Disorder, MSD. This is a common term used for repetitive workplace injuries. Hierarchy of controls. This is a method of systematically analyzing and dealing with hazards in the workplace. And manual handling, moving and lifting things. Before we begin, our usual pep talk. How do we get good at something or competent at doing something? Here's our favorite formula again. Competence is a function of knowledge, perseverance and talent. 70% knowledge, 20% perseverance, 10% talent. What does that mean? We've all heard the saying, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different result. Knowledge is truly power. How to be successful at your job. Working as a professional engineering tradesperson has its challenges. It requires many skills. Being competent is not the only tool required in our professional's toolbox. Let's look at some of the other tools that we can use to help us get the job done. Number one, be competent. This is no surprise. This is the first one of our list. We've looked at our formula for competence already. Am I competent enough to complete the task and get the job done? Number two, be knowledgeable in general. Have I researched the task? How well do I know my customer? Do I know who the boss is? Number three, be punctual. Am I reliable? Can I be relied on to get the job done in the time allocated? Can people set their watch by me? Number four, be ethical. Am I of good character? Number five, be respectful. Am I conscious of social protocols and unconscious bias? Am I sensitive to differences in cultures and people's backgrounds? Number six, be cool headed. Is my ego in check? Have I got all the facts? What about empathy towards the other person? Be confident. Does my body language and actions project competence and instill trust in my work and in myself? Number eight, be a role model. Am I projecting a good image for my profession? Am I a guardian of the integrity of my profession? We can't memorize everything. Reference materials are critical in getting the job done. With the advent of portable electronic devices, all connected to the cloud via the internet, it's never been easier to have information at your fingertips. The Machinery's Handbook is an excellent example of a good reference for engineers. Before we continue, let's have a quick refresher on risk assessments. This is a great video from WorkSafe South Australia. We'll be looking at uh, risk assessments later on in this lecture, so let's have a quick look.
Hello and welcome. I'd like your full attention while I briefly go through some safety concerns in this short workplace safety presentation. There are three key steps towards safety in the workplace. Identifying the risk, assessing the risk, controlling the risk and reviewing its effectiveness. Put simply, the best way to prevent injuries or illness is to find potential hazards and fix them. Please take the next few moments to consider the following key procedures. Wherever possible, eliminate the risk. Simply remove the hazard. Substitute the hazard. Substitute the hazard with a new piece of equipment or work practice. Isolate. Isolate the hazard or hazardous work practice. Engineering controls. Adapt tools or equipment to minimise risk. Administrative controls. Change work practices or implement more training. And of course, make sure personal protective equipment is worn when required. Remember, safety is an ongoing practice. Just because it's safe today, doesn't mean it's safe tomorrow. What is a musculoskeletal disorder? A musculoskeletal disorder is caused by how you do things, not by the equipment you're using. Losing your arm in a machine is not a musculoskeletal disorder, for example. RSI, repetitive strain injury, was previously used to describe all types of injuries caused by repetitive movements. Musculoskeletal disorder, MSD, was recently adopted to describe specifically workplace related repetitive injuries. What are some of the musculoskeletal disorders? Sprains, strains of muscles, ligaments and tendons. Back injuries. Spinal discs. Muscles in the back. Skeletal, bone-related injuries, muscular and vascular disorders caused by vibration. Musculoskeletal disorders can manifest in two ways. The first way, gradual wear and tear of joints and ligaments, muscles and intervertebrae discs caused by repeated or continuous use of the same body parts including static body positions. If we look at the blacksmith here, it's a prime example of gradual wear and tear over a long time. Number two, damage caused by strenuous activity or unexpected movements, such when loads that have been handled move or change position suddenly. Lifting a load that's too heavy or unbalanced using a poor or incorrect technique, losing or dropping a load, being hit by a load or losing a load and it ends up on top of you, injuries from chemical spills, burns, toxic fumes and gases, psychological hazards associated with boredom and repetitious tasks. Who's legally responsible for workplace safety? Well, the first one, persons conducting a business or undertaking, a PCBU, otherwise your employer or the company that you work for. The second one are the designers, manufacturers, importers, suppliers, and the installers of the plant substances or structures. The third one is officers, and this is basically your direct supervisor irrespective of the legal definition of who is responsible for safety, safety is everybody's responsibility. Don't forget about your ethical and leadership responsibilities. If we're creating a risk assessment, we're gonna to have to identify the hazards. The first thing we need to do is consult with the stakeholders. Other, in other words, everybody involved. 
do I have all the information on the task and the items involved? Do I have any historical information, incident reports, complaints? Is the problem getting worse? Or is it specific to a particular staff member? Now that we've identified a hazard, we will need to identify the cause before we can implement a solution. Makes sense. Let's look at some of the forces that cause musculoskeletal injuries. Repetitive forces, lifting and stacking goods or boxes onto pallets, racks and vans. Sustained force occurs when force is applied continually over a period. Some examples, pushing or pulling a trolley around a warehouse, pushing and pulling boxes onto, out of racks and vans. High force, overexertion of muscles. This occurs when increased muscle effort is required in response to a task. Holding a chainsaw or a hammer drill for a long, prolonged period of time is a high force activity. Sudden force, jerky or unexpected movements, for example, throwing or catching boxes, especially problematic if the boxes are a little bit too heavy. Repetitive movement, doing the same thing over and over and over all day. Posture. Poor postures can exert unwanted forces on particularly vulnerable parts of a person's body. Sustained posture, where part of the whole body is kept in the same position for a prolonged period. Some examples, continually standing on one leg, holding something up with one arm in the same position for a long time, or prolonged sitting at a workstation in the same position without moving. Awkward posture, where any part of the body is in an uncomfortable or unnatural position. For example, squatting while servicing a piece of equipment, working with your arms overhead, bending over a desk, looking around the side of a trolley while pushing it along a, a walkway. Vibration is another force that can cause injury. Whole body vibration occurs when vibration is transmitted through the whole body, usually via a supporting surface like a seat or a floor in heavy machinery or equipment. Examples of whole body vibration may include operating mobile plants such as heavy moving equipment, driving a vehicle over rough terrain. Hand arm vibration. This occurs when vibration is transferred through a vibrating tool, steering wheel or controls in heavy machinery. Some examples of hand arm vibration, impact wrenches, chainsaws, jackhammers, grinders, drills, or vibrating compacting equipment, even nail guns. Let's look at some tips in avoiding lifting injuries. Avoid objects that are difficult to grip or hang on to, bulky, awkward, too big, asymmetrical. Get some assistance or use a mechanical device like a trolley if the item is too heavy or awkward to maneuver. When lifting anything below your waist, for example, uh, weightlifters at the gym, when they're doing their deadlifts, their backs are straight, their knees are bent, and they're looking straight ahead. Don't twist your waist while you're holding a load. Move your feet. When lifting, keep your feet at least shoulder width apart with your feet firmly planted on the ground. Straighten your knees, keep your back straight. The lifting is done through your knees, not your back. Avoid lifting items over your head. 
If you have to reach for something high, use a stool or a ladder to get the item at least to your chest level. Keep the load close to your chest and elbows in tight. Keep the load balanced. Always use two hands when lifting. Never overstack or overload, as loose or heavy items can fall. Let's look at a real life scenario. The service technicians are complaining that they are hurting their backs and lifting certain boxes from the warehouse onto their vans. The boxes and contents are often damaged. The boxes in question are hose fittings in boxes of 500. The boxes weighing 40 kilos each. Firstly, we need a risk assessment. We'll need to identify the stakeholders, which postures, movements and forces are involved or causing the problem. When do these problems occur? Why they are occurring? And what we can do to fix the problem? Step one, does the task involve repetitious or sustained movements, postures or forces? Yes. Does the movement involve bending forwards, sideways or twisting more than 20 degrees? Yes. Are there any bending backwards motions? Yes. Are there any movements involving my arms and hands? Yes. Are there any movements involving my legs? Yes. Are there any fast motions? Yes. Step two. Does the task involve any high or sudden force? Yes. Frequent manipulation of the heavy boxes has been identified clearly here. Is there any hand, arm or whole body vibration? In this particular instance, no. A risk has been clearly identified, therefore a control is necessary. We've identified the risk or the hazard. Now we've got to identify or work out how we're going to control this risk or hazard. The hierarchy of control is a system commonly used for controlling risks in the workplace. It is a step-by-step -step approach to eliminating or reducing risks. It ranks controls from the highest level of protection and reliability through to the lowest. Elimination being the highest level of protection, PPE being the lowest level of protection. Elimination. This control measure involves eliminating or removing the risk completely. Substitution. Can we change the product with something else? Engineering controls. Can we redesign the infrastructure or use mechanical devices to solve the problem? Administrative controls. Can we use training or enforce certain procedures or techniques to solve the problem? Personal protective equipment, PPE. Could PPE be used in conjunction with other controls be used to uh, solve the problem? Regarding our box handling problem, can we use elimination? Can we eliminate moving the box of fittings from the rack to the work van? Could we remove the fittings one by one out of the larger boxes or move them over to the van in smaller quantities or place them in lighter, smaller boxes? Would this solution be more reasonably practical? What new risks would be created? For example, repetitious movements and multiple trips to the vans. What about substitution? Can we substitute the product for something lighter? Substitution. It would be unlikely our customer would redesign their product to suit our handling difficulties, but we could request that our supplier ship the fittings in boxes of 100 instead of 500. This would drop the weight of each box to 8 kilograms, for example. Engineering controls. Can we utilize mechanical assistance moving the boxes around like hydraulic lift tables, trolleys? What about redesigning the racking, installing conveyor belts? We could use lifting aids and trolleys, hydraulic lift platforms, etc. What about the pushing and pulling into vans and racks? Is that still going to be a problem? Administrative controls. Will training help? Can we get a specialist coach to come in and train the staff on the correct lifting 
techniques. Any new administrative methods will have to be documented and advertised. Training will definitely be required if new technology is involved, otherwise new hazards have been introduced. The least effective, PPE, personal protective equipment. In this particular scenario, PPE, work boots, high-vis vests, etc., would have little impact on reducing the hazard. In our scenario, we have decided that the most reasonably practicable control methods are substitution, engineering, and administrative. Substitution, we're going to be using smaller and lighter boxes. Engineering, we'll be utilizing mobile hydraulic lift platforms. Administrative, we're going to update our SOPs and we're going to organize training. We negotiated with our supplier and they agreed to pack the boxes in lots of 100, bringing the weight down to 8 kilos a box, easily manageable. We purchased a number of hydraulic lift platforms which are easily maneuverable and have brakes. Administrative. Training on the hydraulic lift platforms was organized and an occupational therapist was employed to coach everyone on lifting and posture.